one is igniting Kim's wrath. In the status quo, Cho Sang Han of the New York Times explains that North Korea has stopped building short range missiles in favor of missiles that can cross the Pacific Ocean. While these missiles cannot threaten South Korea, installing FAD reverses this trend. Ankit Panda, the diplomat, reports that in May, North Korea finished developing missiles specifically aimed at getting past South Korean missile defense with plans to mass produce them in the, uh, the event of deployment. Contention 2 is promoting peace. CNN notes that Moon, unlike his predecessors, is seeking peace with North Korea. The Guardian adds that last month, South Korea offered the North a chance at diplomacy and peace talks to defuse tensions. However, deploying missile defense systems would undermine diplomatic efforts by angering the Kim regime. Reuters notes that one important part of negotiations would be the restoration of military hotlines between the two countries. This is essential as Daniels of CNBC concludes that restoring the Seoul Pyongyang hotline would serve as a powerful way to reduce the danger of conflict and miscalculation. Historically, the last period of diplomacy between the two Koreas was the most productive ever. Nathan Park of Foreign Policy reports in May that the previous Sunshine policy resulted in a reduction of tension and fear. Over 2 million South Koreans visited North Korea, the Korean presidents had actual in-person meetings, and North Korea agreed to the removal of its nuclear program under talks, all of which created true safety and stability on the Korean peninsula for the first time ever. Contention 3 is pivoting east. China objects to that because its radar has the ability to spy on Chinese missile systems and it represents growing U.S. influence in the region. Since deployment in March, Chinese relations with South Korea have rapidly deteriorated with Chinese sanctions followed by the cancellation of key peace talks. South Korea now has the unique chance to change course. Mercy Quo, the diplomat, argues that halting the deployment of that would send a powerful message that South Korea is reprioritizing their alliances away from the United States. A Chinese government newspaper reported that Seoul needs to make a choice be between deploying FAD and resuming Sino-South Korean relations. It should not hope to have it both ways because stopping the deployment of FAD is the bottom line of China. Choosing China over the United States is critical for long-term regional stability. China is currently locked in a proxy war with the U.S. and South Korea and cannot afford to pressure North Korea to denuclearize. Doing so would give up its presumptive ally's biggest bargaining chip, invite American aggression, and wound China's hegemony. However, were South Korea to align with China, China would no longer have an incentive to support North Korean aggression. Andrei Lenkov, professor of Korean studies, argues that given the choice, China would prefer to side with South Korea. The reasoning is simple. China wants a peaceful East Asia dominated by liberal trading economies, and North Korea is the antithesis of this vision. China only continues to prop up the regime due to America's involvement. Chinese sanctions are not a hypothetical, but rather a certainty if the U.S. cooperates. Time Magazine writes that in a direct response to bad deployment, China has offered a double freeze agreement where South Korea decreases military drills and suspends bad deployment in exchange for Chinese pressure and sanctions on North Korea. Because sanctions do not work without Chinese enforcement, Chinese pressure is the only way to curb North Korean aggression. Julian Ryle of The Telegraph reports that North Korea imports 500,000 tons of crude oil from China every year, making up 90% of its oil supply. Kim Young of The Daily NK explains that China cutting off North Korea's oil would disable North Korea's military as missiles, vehicles, ships, and planes would all be rendered ineffective. In fact, China has shown their willingness to use oil pressure. Bethany Allen of Foreign Pol Policy Magazine writes that China sees oil exports as a major tool to keep North Korea in line, and in 2003, they closed an oil pipeline to pressure North Korea towards six-party talks about denuclearization. Thus, we're proud to make it. Partner ready? Awesome. Anika and I have heard, resolved, deployment of anti-missile systems is in South Korea's best interest. We offer one observation. That does not threaten neighboring countries because that is useless. That's for two reasons. First, North Korea has other methods to destroy South Korea. Bowden 17 of the Atlantic finds that North Korea has access to heavy artillery that can kill millions of South Koreans regardless of an anti missile system. Second, North Korea has been testing itself against that and has found a way around it. North Korea knows that that is an effect. A 2017 article from Washington Times explains that North Korea has been watching that development and has already figured out two ways of beating that. First, North Korea has practiced launching multiple missiles to overwhelm FAD, and second, North Korea has practiced launching missiles from submarines to avoid FAD's radar. At that point, impacts about governments thinking FAD is really effective are completely irrelevant. Contention one is a sense of safety. Even if countries know FAD doesn't work, the people don't know that. 
Lockheed Martin's, Martin's tested commercials say that has a 100% success rate. Even if this isn't true, that makes South Korean people feel safe. That's why 80% of South Koreans now support DAD, according to an RRAN article from two weeks ago. Making South Koreans feel safe is really important. Hoi Kulainen, 04 of BMC Public Health, finds that especially for youth, a fear of an imminent nuclear attack increases the chance of mental disorders and anxiety twofold. Contention two is political poison. Mr. Moon, the newly elected liberal president of South Korea, is walking a very tenuous path in the status quo. Kim 17 of Reuters explains that Mr. Moon's party controls only 40% of seats in the nation's parliament, continuing that most proposals require a 60% majority in order to become law. That's why Griffith 17 of CNN explains that Moon was forced to build a coalition of centrist and right-wing parties in order to help pass legislation. If Moon terminated that deployment now, that would destroy Moon's coalition, because Moon's rating would tank. Three weeks ago, when North Korea first tested a hydrogen bomb, a bomb, South Korean public opinion swung strongly in favor of bad missile defense. Thus, as we said earlier, a 2017 Arwang article reports that in the last three months, support for THAAD has grown from 50% to over 80% today. If Moon were to remove THAAD right now, his approval ratings would be. This is problematic because Kim 17 of Australian National University explains that Moon's coalition is held together solely by the strength of his unprecedentedly high approval ratings. Other politicians want to work with Moon because they want to piggyback on his popularity. And if he looks like a falling star, they try to disassociate with him so that they can remain supported by voters. After removal of Thad, Moon would not have a workable coalition and would not be able to pass any policy. Look to Kim of Reuters who finds the previous president, Park, couldn't gather a coalition in parliament and thus couldn't pass any of her major bills. Terminating Thad's deployment puts Moon in the same position, unable to hold his coalition together and thus unable to pass policy. This is very bad, because Moon's policies are excellent. First, the stimulus package. Jung 17 of CNBC explains that Moon plans to enact a $10 billion stimulus package, which would be used to hire new firefighters, policemen, and government employees, estimated to directly increase employment by 810,000 public sector jobs. Reuters in 2017 specifically states that removing that, or keeping Thad, removing Thad drives a wedge between Moon and the conservatives he needs to pass his jobs plan. Second, solving air pollution. Yonhap 2017 explains that Seoul has the third worst air quality in the entire world. Reuters 2017 explains that Seoul has 10 coal plants that are extremely old and have been emitting particulate matter directly into the urban environment. Moseller 13 of Yale explains that Seoul's deteriorating air quality kills about 200,000 people every decade. Fortunately, Reuters 17 explains that Moon has already announced temporary shutdowns of those 10 plants and plans to invest in renewables in order to completely shut down these plants permanently by 2022. At the end of the day, every country involved in this issue agrees that that is primarily a political issue. Let's discuss politics. Thanks. Let's go back to the thought experiment. A lot of people 
make an internet search. And then they find out. I don't know why all of these people are Googling that on the internet. I mean, if I'm a South Korean, if I'm a South Korean, I'm probably pretty interested in that, you know, right? Actually, so I disagree. I'm telling you that everything they see on TV, everything they're hearing from the government, everything they're seeing in newspapers is telling them that that is really effective. So at that point, they're convinced, or some people are convinced, the ones who aren't conducting weird internet searches about that, are convinced. <laughs> Let's shift away from the thought experiment. Okay. <laughs> so, if I'm seeing North Korea launch a bunch of missiles over Japan and test a hydrogen bomb, that's tension, right? I mean, sure, that's why you want that, to protect you from the tension. Okay, but overall, tension, if I know the tension exists, is going to decrease happiness. I do. One, we're not talking about happiness, we're talking about mental disorders. Mel mental disorders, mental disorders. But I argue that this, like, these nuclear tests, the things they've been seeing on TV that have scared them, have been going on for years. However, THAAD provides a way to eliminate, like, even if there's a marginal increase in tension, THAAD provides a very large decrease no, I would say, in how that tension I would say the them. reason that they want THAAD in the first place is because they see the tension and they're scared of it, sure, right? Tension the approval going on ratings wouldn't have increased. <laughs> no, I agree. But tension's been going on forever. Tension's gotten point. worse now because there's a hydrogen bomb and they can sure. hit the U.S. and they've been launching things over in Japan, right? Sure, which is why THAAD makes them feel really safe and happy. Okay, we'll contest that. Okay. <laughs> Start on their framework that that fails. They're going to apply this to say since that is not a threat, people don't see it as a threat, and it will lead to more impacts, but it actually will. That's because even if that doesn't necessarily work, countries will perceive it differently. Let's start on our convention too about North Korea. The Global Research Foundation found that back during 2003, while they believed that missile defense wasn't a threat, North Korea did. And that was actually the cause of the end of the Sunshine Policy, Bush escalating tensions by deploying missile defense systems in South Korea. What this ultimately means is that for their side, North Korea does believe that even if these missile defenses aren't necessarily successful, they still believe as an perceived encroachment and they see it as an escalation of tensions. Ultimately, we still gain our access into our Convention 2 about increased tensions. Then, on our Convention 3 on China, Convention 3 is contingent on the radar of that, not the success of that. It says that China will want to work with South Korea and it won't want to work with South Korea in a world in which the radar encroaches on China. So even if that doesn't work, it doesn't really matter. We still link in about these conventions. With that amount of time, we Convention 1 about mental illness. So. First of all, to realize it's pretty important that happiness ultimately occurs at, at, like, at the end result because mostly because of tensions. Like whoever, whoever wins tensions in the round, whoever wins that war is more probable and either world is going to be winning their happiness argument. Moreover, South Koreans won't be very happy when they find out that that doesn't work as per their framework because it's pretty obvious it doesn't. Then, on condition two, on a political trade-off. A lot of overarching responses to both policies here and then I'll get into the degree. So, first of all, let's realize that the reason why they did deploy that wasn't because they, they did deploy that was not because of a trade-off for eventually reach either of these policies, but rather for operational control trade-off. That's because you can look to the New York Times, which found that Moon wanted operational control over his own military away from the United States, and the conservatives didn't. Uh, the conservatives wanted the United States operational control, but they also wanted that to be implemented. What this means is that at the end of the day, the compromise is not going to be either health or climate. It's going to be for operational control, and once that happens, they lose all of their offense there. There's two reasons why this uh, operational control trade-off is more probable than their two trade-off examples. First of all, because there's more literature on it, there is no literature out there that says that that was deployed in order to have their, this, like, these two, uh, these two uh, policies. But actually, the New York Times evidence is very specific that the reason why that will be deployed is to have operational control taken back from the United States. But then second of all, because we have complementary policies here, for example, we see compromise within the same branches of government, military to military, rather than from military to something completely other like climate change. A few more responses here on the overall issue. There's going to be like six more. Second of all, if that is completely ineffective, we would be seen as somebody who escalates tensions without actually solving anything, so in the long term, he would lose popularity as soon as they realize that that is actually completely useless. Then, moreover, realize that more votes in their world doesn't actually mean anything unless they can pass the threshold, right? Like, policies are not passed when you have an increase in the amount of votes. There's a binary system. You either have 59, which means no policy, or 60 votes, which means you pass the policy. And if you actually reach the 60 vote threshold, they only simply say we're going to be seeing an increase in the amount of votes. Moreover, they, like, what, they, they don't ever like give us probability in this, because where were the talks of trade off and these new policies back when we actually did deploy that in May, and right now in the status quo, we've had that in the past two weeks, they don't give you any probability analysis there. Even more so, they don't actually tell you that Moon's popularity drastically fell after that was paused. There's just a lot of holes in this argument, right? Like the narrative is not very consistent with what's actually been happening in real life. It's a very debate argument, not a real life argument. Then, moreover, on the intent. The intent of that, my, my opponents say, is not for a trade-off policy. They say it's because of a hydrogen bomb, which means Moon already conceded to the conservatives. He's not going to get more out of them because he already said, okay, I agree with you guys. I'm not going to try to pass my climate and health policies. Clearly, that is a lot more important. There won't be a trade-off in the future that, like, that deletes the probability. Then finally, realize you turn it again because willingness to focus on the other issues like health like healthcare and climate change only comes if you solve the most pertinent issue in South Korea, which is tensions, which is why South Korea for decades has not been focused on these important issues. On the two specific policies, 
burst on the stimulus. Reuters argues it already got passed on July 22nd, which is like if you if you like um, no one that was deployed about a week or two before that. Then second of all, on climate regulations, Reuters says in 2015 that South Korea already passed climate change policy that plans to cut emissions by 37 percent, making it not unique. The reason why Seoul has such bad air quality is not because South Korea has bad policies. It's because 50 percent of the South Korean population lives within Seoul, meaning that no matter what they do, the air quality is going to be pretty bad. But South Korea is clearly working towards solutions. Their case is very not unique. That's what we urge you to vote down. <laughs> So, I'm going to start off with two overviews to their case, <coughs> and then I'm going to go down their case. Sound good? <laughs> okay, let's begin. Two overviews before I get into the details of their case. First of all, their impact he has tried to expand in rebuttal is that tensions get high. But recognize, tensions are already high in the status quo. North Korea is launching so many missile tests, and South Korea is launching missile tests in response. At that point, tensions are as high. They never actually prove to you that tensions lead to any type of tangible impact. It's really not that important. But second of all, the only tangible impact that could potentially come from their case that's not tensions is war. But war is improbable for seven reasons. First of all, the corporate threat of war is way overblown. Day 17 of the Washington Bureau explains that the media has exaggerated threats of war, but it almost certainly will not occur. But second of all, Trust the experts, not the media. Dale continues that the consensus of the experts is that North Korea has been making these kinds of threats for years, but they will not, not attack. But third of all, if that's because if North Korea started a war, their nation would literally cease to exist. This deal 17 explains that Kim Jong Un's goal is to stay in power and survive. Starting a war is literally hurting his own regime. But fourth, a North Korean deterrence has been effective. They don't need an attack to feel safe. K-17 of the USC explains that Kim Jong Un is doing missile tests to deter U.S. action, and it's working. No attack is needed. But fifth, diplomacy, current diplomacy, preventionist calculation. Frederick 17 of the New York Post reports that the the United States and North Korea have a line of communication. They could use it if they're worried about potential attack. But six, trust history. The U.S. and North Korea have hated each other for seven decades and never intentionally or unintentionally attacked each other. In fact, Park of the Korean Institute reports that in 1994, the situation was far more tense, but no attacks ever ensued. But seven, seven your, in, your actions are inconsistent with a high chance of war. If you believe their fictional war scenario, you're going to have to contact all your friends at the West Coast and tell them to evacuate. The impact disproves the link. At that point, war is never going to happen. Tensions really don't matter, and they're non-unit. They literally have no impact in today's round, but let's talk about their case anyways. Their first contention talks about how North Korea starts changing their missiles. First of all, <laughs> that can intercept these short-range missiles either way. It really doesn't matter. But second of all, if they don't use it per our case, this contention really doesn't matter. But, I mean, per my overview, it really doesn't matter. Second of all, they talk about creating peace with this hotline. We have um, three resp uh, four responses. Three responses. First of all, you can, they tell you that Moon supports diplomacy, but per our second contention, Moon can't pass his policy of diplomacy if he doesn't have support in the, in, in the government. But second of all, what Frederick tells you is that the, the, you know, North Korea has a hotline with the United States, and at the point where the United States is somewhat advocating for South Korean interests, they're, they're, all, they're going to be talking in the, in the status quo. But third, if you want to have diplomacy, you turn to our side. Um, that because of Bando 16 of the World Post, who finds that the United States has empirically refused to negotiate before North Korea fully denuclearizes, unique, but that changes up because saw the diplomat finds that that creates a safety net for the United States to negotiate in the case that things end poorly. At that point, turning to this argument, tensions go low, get lower in our world because you have more negotiations. But finally, go on to the third contention about making China treaties. First of all, this idea, this contention is really silly. It, first of all, it's predicated on the assumption that if we deploy that, the United States is completely going to get, get out of the region, and thus China is going to completely switch to North, South Korea. But one, they don't give you a single piece of evidence to say that, that says that there's a full shift. They just say that the United States might get a little bit upset. But recognize, the Sejong Institute tells you that, no, the Sejong Se of the Sejong Institute tells you that the alliance and the United States-South Korea have become a lot stronger to sudden policy disputes like this. At that point, that really isn't what you make the United States want to leave the region or South Korea to shift to North, um, China. There's really no link. But second of all, even if like, their ultimate impact to this is telling you that China is going to be able to sanction North Korea, we have a couple of responses of why these sanctions will not work. First of all, China isn't able to control North Korea. The glory 17 of Yonsei University finds that while North Korea is dependent on China, they're an autonomous state that is worried about maintaining sovereignty. He further that it's roughly easy, as easy for China to solve this problem as for the U.S. to bring peace to the Middle East and then Israel give up their nuclear weapons. But second of all, China has bigger things to worry about. Freedom 17 of the Atlantic finds that China is worried about debt destabilizing North Korea who created an opportunity for an American intervention but yet another American client state who directly on their border. That's why Freedom continues that China is empirically hobbling their sanctions. They won't be infected. But third of all, because Russian interventions under Undermine these sanctions. YL17 and Joshwell explains that Russia is taking advantage of the conflict to continue strategy and supporting unruly regimes to undermine U.S. influence. In fact, he further said Russia has increased trade by 85% with North Korea to offset the harm of Chinese sanctions. These Chinese sanctions won't be effective. But at the end of the day, even if you want to believe that sanctions are going to happen, I mean, sanctions are going to happen, that's their problem. They're problematic for two reasons. First, they won't lead to denuclearization. The, the escape for advice that the, the, um, as sanctions increase, North Korea just shifts the cost to their poor. Ready for cost? 
So, all right, everyone ready? Starting on your war overview. So you keep saying that like war is guaranteed not to happen, but don't we say that before like every great war that happens, like war just won't happen? I'm not sure that we saw it, but the situation is really great. Like, right? Like, who's going to start the war? What? Who's going to start the war? Are we tell you that nobody can predict who's going to start the war. It usually happens by miscalculation. Sure, but what's that? Question the reason for so long. We have sign miscalculation. Yeah, we have. So, like, the reason, so I can tell you back, like, the Soviet Union and, like, the U.S., right? There were yeah. 1,000 instances of weirdness sure. that could have led to war. The reason why this didn't occur was they had a hotline between the two. Between South Korea and North Korea, there's a complete blackout, and they're way closer than the oh, U.S. and Soviet Union. Hold on, first of all, it's not the United States and North Korea are talking, correct? The card that we read you about the hotline. Ryan, we'll so, talk about you. Sure, okay. So, you know, like, oh, well, actually, you, like, like, in other situations, there was an actor who had a, like, a logical reason that they wanted to go to war. Like, may, like, maybe in the past, wars have happened, right? But the past was not nuclear war. Nuclear this war is... Not, our case is not about nuclear war. Sure, but, any, wait, but any, any war between North Korea and the United States obviously will escalate to nuclear war. No, it won't. Yeah. Kim Jong-un was never going to use nuclear weapons. As sure, but the United States... Wait, it. if he doesn't use nuclear weapons, the United States can still retaliate with a nuclear weapon. We wouldn't use nuclear weapons either because they have an ICBM. We have mutually assured destruction. But conventional yeah, war is actually on. pretty wait, probable, but right? Mu but mutually, sh wait, mutually assured destruction comes from the fact that we have nuclear weapons, right? Yeah. Yeah, so we have nuclear weapons where nobody's going to launch. It doesn't mean, like, you're really oversimplifying this. It's not like a conventional war happens, no, but a nuclear saying, war doesn't no, no, happen because they don't guys, use a nuclear I'm war. The guys, idea of nuclear no. sure, destruction is that we won't go to war in the first place in fear of retaliation. Okay. So that's not our argument. I'm simply saying that when you give seven reasons why war won't happen, there's like, it's you can't predict the future. Like, everybody says, they said that before World War One. like, oh, we are in a great like period of, like, stability. We're, we're like, not predicting. Wait, power. wait, we're not like, predicting. Like, we're like, oh, James, we're, do James, we're not predicting again, the future. Like James, we're, give, we're not predicting the future. We're giving clear incentives why every single actor who's potentially going to be a part of this well, war yeah, after, does not want well, to. After World War One, they were like, oh, crap, like, wars are really bad for the economy. We really shouldn't do that again. But wait, then they did. Wait, hold on. The problem is, in all those scenarios, at least, like, there was an actor who was like, we want to go to war. Give me the well, okay, probability. Yeah, sure, give me I the probability. There reasons why war could occur. I, yeah. This is our app case, yeah. but, um. So, for example, North Korea might, like, Kim Jong-un might be losing power and might need war as a means to rally the elites. No, we but see, do a, like, wait, 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 James, but do a winning analysis, right? Like, you have warns why war will happen, I have warns why war won't happen. My question is, No, no, what? Your, your argument is that there are no, there is no reason why war would happen. I just gave you a reason. So the weighing analysis is not like nope. that. Oh, no, Jake, you're really muddling this. Like, you, my analysis is that war is really unlikely to happen for all these reasons. No, there aren't reasons why war could happen. <laughs> And I just gave we you said a reason. Another never... reason is the U.S. could intervene because they're scared wait, of North Korea's missiles. You can still weigh like, the... There are a bunch wait, of reasons can... why war could happen. Yeah, but are... Uh, sure. I mean, like, sure. I... <laughs> I mean, like, instead of an option. Oh, whatever, whatever. Don't worry about it. <laughs> is everybody ready? Yeah. One big observation on their case first. Moon still has an opposition, so that means if Moon deploys a missile defense system that doesn't work, the opposition party's probably going to be like, yo, by the way, this doesn't work, why are you just increasing tensions for no reason? And then that brings us to like, uh, and that decreases political cooperation, by the way. But that brings me to their overview where it's like, tensions don't matter. At, uh, big problem. I forgot my computer. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 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 This is not exactly Yale Finals material, I'm sorry. <laughs> that brings me to their overview, but they tell you that tensions don't matter. There's three reasons that they do. The first one is the economy, because when Trump tweeted about North Korea's tensions, it brought down South Korea's economy down by 1%. I'd say that's a pretty big impact. The second one is political, because aggression from North Korea to South Korea leads to a trade-off in domestic policy, because, North, because South Korea is not going to be willing to pass domestic policy if their main threat is still a foreign policy issue. The third one is the military, because the chance of a miscalculation is still always going to be high as long as North Korea has nuclear weapons, which they don't solve for, which I would say is still a pretty big impact of tension. Then their big overview, where they give you seven reasons why like war is never going to happen. These are all intentional reasons. We tell you the only cause of war is going to be the miscalculation, which they don't address for and you cannot predict. At that point, we're going for our second contention about like uh, promoting peace. They give you a couple of responses. The first one is that diplomacy doesn't happen if there's no political support, but South Korea supports diplomacy because they don't want a war to be the solution to the Korean crisis. The second one is that the U.S. is going to refuse to negotiate because there's like no safety net. But that contradicts their framework where they tell you that that doesn't work, which means that they
they really need to pick one there. But the second one is that given that their framework is true, that means that the U.S. knows that that doesn't work, but they're still willing to negotiate, which is a pretty good reason to vote for us. The third one is that the hotline already exists, but their evidence says it's a back, ch uh, like back channel diplomacy and it's not a hotline. The Washington Times evidence tells you that there is no hotline right now. At that point, you can just sneak boycott evidence that we give you this is that Moon wants diplomacy in exchange for uh, like uh, when that gets repealed. McCrary tells you that South Korea's offer diplomacy in the past, but North Korea doesn't want it because the missile defense increases tensions too much. The New York Times evidence tells you that missile defense specifically precludes negotiation, but tensions decreasing them is really good for two reasons. The first one is because a hotline re reduces the chance of a miscalculation, which is the only cause of tensions in war. The second one is that negotiations, when you bring everyone to the table, there's no chance of a miscalculation, which decreases tension and is the cleanest way to protecting South Korea's interests. Start off from our idea of tensions in war generically. We give you seven responses to rebuttal as to why war is going to happen. They just tell you that miscalc might mean that higher tensions lead to war. The problem is you can trust history. That's a response they never respond to. Park tells you that in the past, tensions have risen much higher than this without war actually happening. At that point, the reason for that is because miscalc still requires someone to strike first, and no one is willing to strike first. War isn't going to happen. But on their other impacts of tensions, they never respond to the non-unique the unique read at the top of a rebuttal saying tensions are already about as high as they can be. They don't prove to you that that's actually going to change effectively. But move on to their case, the only impact they extend is I say, this idea of diplomacy. Keep in mind two things that are really important. The first is that it's happening right now. We read you the card that says that back channel negotiations have already opened up and are already going on. That's really crucial because their impact of this hotline says that when negotiations happen, you're likely to open this hotline. At that point, if negotiations are happening now, they don't give you an actual reason why anything needs to change. But second, remember the moon turn, that moon is the one in the uh, South Korean government who really wants diplomacy to happen. The majority of the South Korean government is conservative and isn't behind diplomacy. At that point, you need to have an empowered moon in order to actually have diplomacy occurring. Now let's move into our case about politics. They completely misunderstand our point because they think it's about getting conservatives to work with Moon. That's not what it's about. What we tell you is that 80% of South Koreans in the past two weeks have switched their minds because of North Korean tests to thinking that that is really effective. If Moon were to now pull away their safety net and say, oh, by the way, North Korea is getting aggressive, but now we don't need an anti-missile system, they're going to be really upset, which is why Moon's popularity is going to decrease. But Kim tells you the only reason Moon is able to form this uh, coalition in parliament to get over him having a minority impact policy is because he's really popular. At that point, if politicians get, they don't think he's going to be as popular, they back away from him, he can't pass policy. They give you two other responses. One is it's about OpCon, we tell you it's about Parliament. Second, they say we don't prove probability. We tell you in case that before this shift in like popularity and the 80% thing, Moon was able to pass policy, so clearly he makes it work. But finally, keep in mind, the impact is really critical. That, uh, in the status quo, he's trying to enact these economic policies to create 810,000 jobs. That Reuters card said he made a start, but it doesn't say he finished it. <coughs> Pyongyang have been in communication. What does this communication sound like? They were negotiating with each other. I think it was over the release of some journalist that was there, but they also yeah. But there were a lot of other things too, like oh, I will destroy you with fire and fury, or I'm going to shoot a missile at Guam, right? Like this doesn't sound like good diplomacy to me. I completely agree, but that's what Trump is tweeting. What we're telling you, you guys say that North Korea is completely unwilling to negotiate without uh, when Thad is deployed. What we're telling you is that even with Thad deployed, we've been seeing negotiations, and you don't give me a reason no, why your negotiations have triggered like impact. Negotiations that have done absolutely yeah. nothing. Wait, Negotiations are really bad. Like you told me about that journalist getting yes. negotiated for, right? That journalist is still in North Korea. Like, sure, but you guys, guys, you don't get to tell me that like your negotiations are going to work, but mine are not. No, these are yeah. like non-existent guys. negotiations. Guys. Like they guys. call them negotiations guys. to make America happy, but like they basically guys. don't exist. Wait, why? What? Do you yeah. <laughs> like James, where did you get this information from? Where did you get your information from? CNN. That's what Trump said. We talked to CNN. I don't really trust Trump. Guys. I mean, like, guys. honestly, he's more likely to be wrong than right. <laughs> you guys tell me that any negotiations are not going to happen with the point of that, but if we have negotiations, no matter how effective they are, they might lead to this impact of like reducing tensions and having this hotline. At that wait. point, if we tell you negotiations are already happening, also, you can't give us a reason why you're so different. Can I see your question? Wait, wait, actually, wait, yeah, I'm just talking yeah, about just one, while. Quick, one quick response. Yeah. Like, U.S. North Korea back channel negotiations like, aren't really what we're talking about, right? Like, the New York Times evidence that I talk about is about negotiations between South Korea and North Korea. Like, maybe yeah, if, guys, you if you don't bring South Korea to be yeah. careful, then they can't respond to the U.S. is an ally of South Korea. Right, you can't respond to the same effect, and you guys didn't respond. Can I ask you a question? You read this response in summary. No, I read it This was in second summary. I think we responded to the question. Sure. Sure. Great. So, you guys talked to me about miscalc. You said that's really the one, right? Yep. Miscalc still requires someone to attack, right? Yes or no? Yeah, but it can be an accident. Do you have a question? 
Okay. Well, why is that important? How is miscalc an accident? Because like someone has to yeah, they, they have like yeah. really bad computers. For example, in the cold war, like a flock of birds, like, <laughs> hold on, for example, in the cold war, like a flock of birds, like, flew over Soviet Russia, and the Russians were like, oh, that could be a nuke, and then they almost pressed the button. That's a miscalculation. But you said almost. Wait. Well, yeah, okay. the reason yeah. why they didn't was because there was a, there was a war, hotline. War they called America. America was like, oh, actually, we didn't launch a missile. By the way, so that was a flock of birds. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> war happens when there's this big red button that someone decides to press. I mean, I'm yeah. simplifying yeah. it a little bit. Like, yeah, maybe there's two kind buttons of. or three buttons instead of one, right? You're going to argue guys, like, miscount doesn't happen because someone, like, accidentally slips into this. It's, it's no, it's not miscount slipping. Miscount happens it's when someone talking. still makes a conscious decision to launch weapons, and we told you, we gave you seven reasons you guys didn't adequately respond to it. And the Soviet Union didn't want to call consciously go to war either, but when they saw a flock of birds, they were like, oh wait, that could be an ICBM, I gotta hit this button. But they didn't. Well, yeah, yeah again, there, there was, was a hotline. Hot line. But even, like, oh, we're like we're repeating ourselves here. Yeah. I know. All even seven people are on, like, watch this one. Okay. Very cross. <laughs> <laughs> Two responses that aren't touched by the end. First of all, if that is truly completely ineffective like my opponents say it is, then Moon would be seen in the long term as somebody who was an incompetent president that increased tensions for a system that completely fails. That means that, it, like, also, they fail to realize there's an opposition party in South Korea. As soon as Moon deploys SAD, they're going to find a reason why that was a bad idea, and they're going to say, oh, well, clearly it didn't work. Don't vote for Moon again. In either world, it's a lose-lose for them. Second, and most importantly, they have dropped the other response that the intent of deploying that was not for some form of trade-off. Instead, Moon conceded to the conservatives and said, tensions are too high. We we must deploy that. What this means is when my opponents say there's already a majority in parliament where the conservatives outnumber the liberals, there is no trade-off going on here. The conservatives have no reason to change their votes because Moon agreed with them. He took their position, meaning there is no change in their world. Finally, and most importantly, they only extend the stimulus argument we tell you that already got passed. You can call the Reuters evidence. It's pretty good about this. With that in mind, let's go to diplomacy. The one response and the new one that we get in summary is they switch the back channel to like a, they switch from a, having a hotline already to the idea that we have back channel negotiations. But those are also really bad. Like if you look to anything in the news in the past two weeks, we can see these back channel negotiations are clearly failing. America's just saying them because we're all scared of nuclear war, right? Like we can see missiles flying over Japan, North Korea, detonating hydrogen bombs. If anything, negotiations are clearly failing. With this in mind, we tell you that we actually solved the problem in two distinct ways. First of all, not deploying that de-escalates tensions. We show North Korea that we are willing to negotiate. And second and most importantly, the New York Times evidence that is dropped by the end of the round found that historically, missile defense systems precluded negotiations. I read that at the very top of my rebuttal. That is why the Sunshine Policy was ended early. What this means is that we only have to prove a decrease in tensions, which is pretty clear to outweigh their case. And there's three reasons why tensions are the most important impact in the round. First is economics. And Brian reasons, all these three reasons are at the top of Brian's summary, and they don't respond to them. First is economics. We tell you, with one tweet about fire and fury, Trump lowered the entire South Korean GDP index by 1%. Clearly, tensions have economic repercussions, too. Second of all is political repercussions. This is the most important one, because in their world, they are locked in a cycle of tension where no truth, solvency on climate change stimulus would ever can actually be reached, because South Koreans will be entirely focused a military spending, they'll never reach their impacts they're talking about. That's a direct turn that goes completely dropped. And finally, there's always a chance of miscalculation that could lead to war. At the end of the day, my opponents have two impacts. First, they have the impact of miscalculation, but they drop the park evidence throughout the entire round that tells you that tensions have been higher than this in the past, and we have never been even close to miscalculation at war. At that point, miscalculation is probable. But second of all, they try to impact out tensions, but they drop the defense that we extend throughout the whole round that tells you that tensions are so high at that point, in either world there are going to be tensions. They don't prove to you that they necessarily get worse. At that point, you're not going to be seeing that tensions lead to any political, economic, or like other impacts that they talk about. It's really not problematic. But that being said, in the status quo, tensions are not going to be happening because of the back channel negotiations that I talk about in rebuttal, they say I don't do what I do, and Jay talks about in summary, we say that the United States and North Korea are talking in the status quo, their impact comes from tensions being de-escalated, de and at the point where they're talking, it doesn't matter if these negotiations are beneficial, if they're talking in the first place, that's literally their impact. At that point, they have no impact off of tensions, they, and, and they have no impact off the war, because it's not probable. The only way you vote is on domestic policy issues within South Korea, and that, do, that those aren't passed for a couple of reasons. First of all, they misunderstand understand our point, because in the status quo, after two weeks, of two weeks, there is an 80% support rate for that anti-missile system. However, if Moon goes against his policy and decides not to pass it, he loses a lot of legitimacy in Parliament, and thus he cannot get his policies passed. They, they, give a, they extend a couple of responses into final focus. First of all, they, need to, they say that we need to prove that the Conservatives were going to pass it anyway. But it's not about Conservatives, it's about engaging Parliament to support his policies. But then they read here this Reuters evidence that tells you that we already passed this economic policy, but recognize that just says we started, we started, like, we started developing the policy, we started passing it, it's an ongoing policy, we told you this throughout the entire round. He needs a lot more support throughout the long-term future in order for Moon to actually pass this policy to give people lives. 
uh, give, give people money. And the impact is critical, the biggest one, because the, the Trump evidence tells you that if Moon is able to pass this, 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 uh, this policy to, to reform the economy, he can create 810,000 jobs for South Korea. That is one, the biggest linkage to South Korea interest on probability, but so I look in probability, but second of all, it's the biggest thing on magnitude. They finally, they try to extend this turn into final focus by telling you, uh, the, in the, by telling you that Moon's going to lose support if, they, if it's not effective, but he can't extend a turn in final focus.